Hi creatives, Lauren Elizabeth here with Lauren Elizabeth Animal Art. I welcome you to another video in this new series I'm doing called Leap Beyond Technique, where I help you connect your story, the good and the ugly, with your best technique, color palette, and the right mindset, most importantly, to create authentic, unique, meaningful, original art. So what we'll be talking about today is the third stage in this creative process, building off of the last video. And I just can't help myself. I love talking about how I paint dogs. So of course, the beginning of this video, we'll talk about my technique, my colors, uh, my inspiration behind this custom pet portrait that I did of Atlas, the sweetest, most adorable golden retriever. Actually, the first one I ever painted with the eyes closed, that was a unique challenge. And I also want to squeeze in spring is around the corner. I'm just itching to paint those spring and baby animals. So comment down below with your favorite spring animal. And I'm going to see if I can get it in for the next video in this series. All right, creatives, without further ado, let's get painting. All right, so the client was very generous with wonderful, good quality photos. Like I had a lot to work with, but I ended up only using two. I was so inspired by the tulip field behind Atlas in one photo, but not super fond of his facial expression, but loved the body language, the positioning, the face on this other photo of Atlas. And I wanted to attempt to try and get his eyes pretty much fully closed, closed which was a new challenge. Now, when I paint golden retrievers, there's two main colors that are more abstract that I almost always include. And that's yellow, it's actually yellow ochre I use, and orange. And also what I often do with golden retrievers is add a green and or blue background to their portrait to complement those oranges in the fur. And then I also wanted some violets in those, as well as those reds in the tulips because I wanted to complement the yellows that I was going to put in Atlas's fur. Hold up, let's pause and talk about some main points about what I just talked about. So I mentioned I used yellow ochre and orange, but here are the rest of the colors that I almost always use when I'm painting golden retrievers. And if you want to create these dynamic, colorful pet portraits with these elaborate backgrounds, I highly, highly recommend you memorize complementary colors. This is like at the heart of color theory, guys. This will help you understand what I'm talking about much better. All right, so once again, I use yellow ochre, orange, burnt sienna, raw sienna, that's like a main ingredient, raw sienna, raw umber, black, and white. And of course I say this often, so sorry if I'm a broken record, but I only use the golden brand white and it's the fluid body paint. The rest I get from Master's Touch, Medium, and Heavy Body Paint. And a lot of people don't believe me when I say this, but it's the truth. The only brushes that I've been using since 2021 for all my pet portraits and my originals and my tutorials are the Arteza Variety Pack and the Detail Brush Pack. They are outstanding brushes. And I actually have them listed down below along with the Master's Touch Paint. Now going back to these complementary colors and the colors that I use for this golden, I use burnt sienna and raw sienna. Both those uh, paint colors have a little bit of red in it and the complementary color of red is green. So you can either have a turquoise background, which is a mix of blue and green, having a light or medium value turquoise background, or have both blue in the background and green like I've done here. And then the blue is the complement of orange, which is also a prime color I use for goldens. Now, if you noticed, I actually put a few dabs here and there on the golden's fur before even starting that background. And if you're in my masterclass or you've heard me talk about my 12 step pet portrait painting process, you know that it's important to get that background done first before the fur, especially with long haired animals where the hair will cut into that background. But with all these colors in that background, it will help me better gauge lightness and darkness, the value of them, when I can see some of those dark and medium values 
already on the golden retriever's body. But here, I actually haven't fully completed that background, especially in the foreground, where a lot of those blades of grass will layer over top Atlas's fur. And the other reason I moved on to that fur and I'm working on it now is because I need to let some of those details in the background marinate. I wasn't actually quite sure how far away I wanted to make those tulips and how I could connect that tulip field to the grass. And I do not like to waste time, so I'll work on another area of the painting, which is gonna be the fur right now, except for that outer edge where it cuts into the background. I'll save that for later. And like I've been going over and covering in this series about the creative process, it helps to place one puzzle piece down and that will help you find the next one. So when you're unsure, just make one step and then the next step will come. Okay, now let's cover what's so specific about this breed. Golden Retrievers have very long, slightly wavy, very thick, soft, and often clumpy fur. The key to creating these clumps carefully, because it's so easy to mess this up, is when you're applying those dark values, create these open sections. Create these gaps, and then you fill them ever so carefully with slightly lighter values going from dark to medium to light. And you absolutely do not want to jump to your light values too soon. Now the other super beautiful, unique characteristic of Goldens is it almost looks like they have a mane, like they look like dog lions. And so what's interesting, as you're painting those clumps around the neck, especially right around the shoulder, those top clumps are gonna be just ever so slightly longer than the bottom ones. So I recommend you work from the bottom when you're placing those first layers down and working up. Now, when it comes to painting fur on dogs, on cats, on any animal, there's five main components. We went over color and the direction of the fur, how it's laying. Then there's length, so how short or medium or long the fur strands are texture so how soft or coarse or wavy or straight the fur is and the last component if there's any markings or patterns in the fur like spots or stripes or rosettes now honestly if you just focus on these five main components with the right technique i believe you can paint any animal with fur so in my online animal art master class that includes my master animal fur course which goes over my five step fur painting process, covering the eight common fur types where I literally show you exactly how I paint animals like lab doodles with that curly, thick, clumpy fur or cockapoos with wavy, light brown fur, even horses, border collies, raccoons. The masterclass is actually the blessing that came from my own battle with addiction, anxiety and depression what helped me so much was applying myself as an artist in animal art while feeding my mind with good things, sermons, TED Talks, watching painting tutorials as well. This was all something that really helped me as both an artist and also helped me so much through recovery. So not only is the masterclass where I place my techniques, my color methods, my fur painting process, my pet portrait painting process, amongst other step-by-step real-time tutorials, it is a place, a community, where I can encourage, support, and bring hope to those struggling creatives going through their own demons. So if this would bless you or a friend, I have links to the masterclass down below. But guys, let's get back to this golden. Now the next thing I wanna talk about before I get into the third stage in my creative system I've developed this creative process, I wanna talk about how to paint these eyes closed on a dog portrait without making it look like a cartoon. Now, as you can tell by the reference photo, Atlas's eyes aren't fully open. They're also not fully closed. So I wanted to go either or here. So I made a much thinner line. I used black. You can either use black or dark brown to create a thinner line that is symmetrical on both sides. The next thing you wanna make sure you have are those medium and dark values between the line you use for the eyes and the bridge of the nose. 
then hugging the outer rim of those lines. You wanna definitely make sure you gradually join those medium and dark values to the light values above that. So you see here how I connected those dark and medium values already, and now I'm adding just a slightly lighter value above it where that light source is hitting the bridge of the nose and the forehead. And because Atlas's mouth is open, causing the side of the mouth to come up slightly, and with his eyes closed, I'm gonna have just a slight little shadow right where it connects from the ear to the side of those eyes. Now, I don't wanna make these lines too extreme. I also wanna make sure they're blended to those lighter values. So I'm using lots of raw sienna, a bit of burnt sienna, a little bit of yellow ochre to help me create these subtle browns. And last but not least, let's talk about the third stage in the creative process. It's the stage I call the metamorphosis. Pulling your painting from that ugly phase into the definition phase where you begin to add those final details. These are the steps that take you to where what Rick Rubin calls you've cracked the code of the painting. It's the big transformation, taking you from the ugly phase to the refining phase where you have no missing parts, but you're still exploring, you're still experimenting, but you know that something is lacking. You might be lacking one thing or many things, but you're trying to get where you have all those parts and then you can be start refining. So right here in this painting, for me, what was missing included the design of the tulips. I wasn't quite sure how I was trying to make those flowers, as well as how many to add to the foreground to get that depth perception right, as well as the clouds. I knew that that sky needed something. I was thinking birds, maybe a sunset, or even some very distant trees. And also, the last thing I wasn't sure, this frisbee. The shadows and the highlights on top over that leg, I wanted to indicate that that leg was right underneath it because right now it's just looking so flat. It doesn't have a whole lot of dimension. Add those right highlights in the right spots to indicate that leg underneath. Now my tips for this phase, this third stage in the creative process, is making sure that you really get the details down, really focusing on that face first, and then moving to the foreground, and then to the background. Because that's actually where the viewer is looking first. That's where our human eyes look first, the focal points, the eyes, nose, and mouth. And then that foreground, that's where we can really see the details because it's close up. And then we're able to slowly make out the background. So I was getting a lot of Atlas's fur done, his face, and adding lots of grass, also doing some refining to the grass, and then I was able to work on that frisbee. This can very much be the most frustrating part of the painting process, but another tip to get you over that hump is to get another pair of eyes. Get another artist friend that can objectively observe your painting, and you can ask them, what does this need? What are the missing parts? And maybe they can give you some inspiration some ideas that, that can inform your work. Now, another area of focus in this stage is the outline around the pet, where you'll eventually at the end be adding those lines, those strands of fur that cut into the background. So that's what I'm doing right here. Also just trying to create more depth, getting those tulips much larger and more detailed up front than they are almost like little dots in the background. Now I'm using my large flat brush to apply that those linear highlights at an angle for the leg underneath this frisbee. I also create an outline around the frisbee just to have a, a little bit more dimension. And again, I just keep going back to different parts of the painting because I'm still not quite sure. And this went on for a very long time. Once I finally cracked the code, those final details only took me a little while. This That part was just so much shorter than this one so the temptation here is to overwork areas, to not be patient, to give up, but you just must continuously step back from your painting, look at the entire piece as a whole, and, and also take lots of breaks. Now you'll see over the next few minutes 
how I work on the grass more, I tweak that frisbee, I finally get in those clouds, and then boom, those details come in super fast. And that's where I'll leave you guys. I hope this tutorial taught you an awful lot about painting golden retrievers, even painting backgrounds, and the third stage in the creative process. Next week, I'll talk about the fourth stage. Now, if you have any questions at all, please leave them in the comments below, as well as letting me know your favorite spring animals. I'll see you in the next video in this series. Thanks for watching. Bye.